Hello everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, bringing you another episode of Trail Talk, where we're diving into the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, trying to better understand the world of the American frontier and the backcountry partisans. Now, with our story of the Overmountain Victory Trail and the Kings Mountain Campaign, more than 400 southwestern Virginia rode under command of William Campbell. This will be the largest number of men under a single colonel during the entire campaign. Now, the size of this Virginian force and the distance that they traveled, it endeared William Campbell to the rest of the Patriot leaders who elected him as their commander for their mission of chasing down Patrick Ferguson. Now, during the Battle of Kings Mountain, half of all of the Patriot wounded would be from these Virginians, along with one third of the Patriot dead. So to learn more about the world of these men from Virginia, I'm joined by Sam McGinty. Now, Sam is a graduate of Randolph-Macon College. He has been involved with living history since 2014. He, is a, he was the military interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg uh, for three years before moving to the Frontier Culture Museum in Stanton, Virginia, where he is the primary historical interpreter for their settlement farm, where he has spearheaded the revamping of the interpretation at that location to focus on life in the 1760s Shenandoah Valley. And he's the lead for the interpretation of Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Crockett's Western Battalion, that spiff, uh, spiffy uniform that you see there in front of you. So, Sam, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So to kind of start out, and we're talking about the Shenandoah Valley, um, these guys are coming from Washington and Montgomery counties for our story. That's going to be at kind of the southern end of the Shenandoah. Uh, many of the other Overmountain men, though they had been raised or at least born in other parts of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, places like uh, like Winchester, um, even just born and then moved out when they're two, three years old. Um, so they're still from the Shenandoah. But if we're unfamiliar with a map of Virginia, where is this area? Where is the Shenandoah Valley? Yeah, so uh, very important question. And I actually did bring a map to actually try to help illustrate that for you. I think I'm going to try to share that to you. Sure. Uh, if you can see that, uh, this is a map that we worked up here at the Frontier Culture Museum for our new signage, which is getting installed within the next few months. Uh, but so if you can see this map, uh, the outlined area in yellow is sort of the initial uh, Shenandoah Valley or more broadly the Valley of Virginia that we try to focus on here. Uh, more or less the areas uh, between the Blue Ridge Mountain and the Appalachian Plateau uh, and between the banks of the Potomac River in the north and the banks of the James River in the south. Uh, so by the 1760s, this is about what we see as far as pattern of settlement, and then the settlement will actually follow further down towards what's now Blacksburg and Christiansburg uh, a little bit later towards the 1770s. Uh, but when speaking about this area, the Valley of Virginia more broadly, we are speaking about one of Virginia's frontiers, but not the only one. Uh, because of the relative geographic isolation that the Blue Ridge Mountains presented, this was an area that was one of Virginia's frontiers from around the 1720s to around the 1770s, uh, while simultaneously, if you looked at the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, what in Virginia we refer to as the Piedmont, uh, where sort of Charlottesville is today, that was also a frontier being settled around the same time. Uh, but so you see the, uh, hopefully on this map, the gray line running through the area, uh, is the main mode of transportation and settlement into this area, which is what is known as the Philadelphia Wagon Road or the Great Wagon Road. Uh, so this Valley of Virginia really was settled north to south as opposed to east to west. Initially, that wagon road had been known as the Great Warriors Trail or Warriors Path, which was a series of trails connecting the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois up north with the Cherokee down in the Carolinas. Uh, so the initial settlers are using that path to come down into the valley from the top. And over time, that path would widen out to the wagon road as you see it here. Uh, but so you see the initial towns of Winchester and Stanton, which were sort of the two big trading hubs in the 18th century, which formed right along the wagon road. Yeah, this is a great map that you're sharing, because when you're looking at this, you have, you know, some modern state borders kind of put on there to help place things. Um, and you're looking, was that about, about halfway across the state of Virginia, halfway west? Mm -hmm. 
And then the, the Shenandoah Valley itself, you're taking up like a good, what is that, two thirds north to south of that mountain thoroughfare there. And you those the ridges that you have marked out for where those different mountain ranges are, it really helps explain why this is a road. And that gray line, like you were mentioning, running from Philadelphia across part of Maryland down through Virginia, um, why it would have to follow those mountain ranges because if it tried to go straight across, you're looking at a series of obstacles there. So it's right, really right. easy to understand why that would have been a, a major native trail and then just expanded. That's really nice. Yeah, uh, it was the, the, the Blue Ridge Mountains in general seem to be this massive encumbrance. Uh, and perhaps that's sort of partly why this area was a quote unquote frontier for as long as it was is that those mountains were so difficult to cross that it just took longer to settle so that even by the time of the Revolutionary War, you really could still argue that the Valley of Virginia is a frontier. Uh, initially, the whole sort of conceit for settling people in this area in general, uh, that the colony of Virginia really wanted to create a buffer zone between uh, the French and their Native American allies, which you some of them you see marked on this map, and separate those quote unquote enemies of, of the state uh, from the good tobacco growing plantations of Eastern Virginia. So between the mountains and a bunch of good Protestant farmers, in theory, you were creating a pretty good buffer zone, which this map we, we designed for our 1760s farm. So it's a little bit more representative of that period, but showing really what the intent was is that this area was meant to take the brunt of the impact during the French and Indian War so that a a lot of the really big plantations could continue to make money for the crown. And that's very important what you were just talking about, because uh, again, with this map, you uh, really like how you have all the different Indian nations labeled out here. You've got uh, Odawa, Wyandotte, Seneca up to the north around the Great Lakes, and then working south the Miami, Delaware, Shawnee, Mingo, and of course the Cherokee down near the Virginia, North Carolina border. Uh, because when a lot of our leaders are our future, Kings Mountain leaders, are growing up young children in the Shenandoah Valley, it's during this time. It's during that French and Indian War, that time of conflict when the Shenandoah Valley is that main buffer. So it's a very nice map to understand not only kind of where we're talking about, but also working in some of the importance into what this valley means to the Virginia Commonwealth and to kind of colonial history. Right. Very cool. So moving on to kind of discussing a little bit more about life in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, we're talking about leading up to the revolution. We're not to the revolution yet, but just talking about the life in the French and Indian War, the 1760s, like you've been sharing with us. What was the valley like? Was it a very busy place? Was there a lot of industry or was it just small farming? Who is usually going to end up living and working in the valley? Yeah, so uh, initially, like I said, uh, the valley is mostly settled by Protestant farmers. Uh, in large part, these are immigrant farmers, uh, people coming from places like Germany and Ireland for the most part, along with some coming from England and some Dutch and some Swiss sort of scattered in there as well. Uh, those that are coming out here really ostensibly are coming in theory to be farmers. Uh, when we look at the farms overall, we're not really looking at the massive plantation system of Eastern Virginia, looking at farms that are a little bit smaller. On average, most of your, or the vast majority of your claims are between about 50 and 250 acres in size. Uh, the difficulty when you look at this area in general is that the people that are coming here beyond the geographic isolation are moving into a dense, thick, old growth forest and having to make farms out of that forest, which is really not an easy proposition. Uh, so far as we can tell, they're not even going for open areas. Uh, the documentation that we have more or less is stating that the people that are coming here are expressly going into areas of good hardwood with the ex uh, sort of uh, express intent that if the area is supporting those good hardwood trees, it'll also support your crops once you actually clear them. But that means clearing the trees which is not an easy thing. Uh, so initially, uh, they're doing really what we have showing here at the museum, which is they're clearing what trees they can, opening up fields, planting crops, and then using whatever trees they've cut to build some semblance of a cabin to get them through the first few years. Uh, so that is a process that could take upwards of a decade before you're starting to really turn this into a proper farm. 
uh, or at least be able to transition towards growing cash crops. Uh, certainly cash crops and agriculture were the big sort of backbone of this area in general, uh, particularly starting in the 1760s. So really at the tail end of the French Indian War, what we see is that this area has a pretty massive economic boom off the back of hemp. Uh, so hemp, uh, pretty durable fibrous plant that for the most part is being used for rope. Uh, starting in 1764, the British Parliament puts a bounty on that hemp, uh, more or less an eight pound, per, eight pound sterling bonus per ton of hemp you grew and sold, which that's on top of the normal selling price. And that sort of leads the, this area to start to take off economically speaking. Uh, if you weren't growing hemp, your other possibility, you might be growing wheat, which becomes pretty common in this area, or you might be growing flax, which of course be used for linen. Uh, but flax is definitely a distant third. Uh, the other thing that we see as far as common industry in this area, we see raising of horses and raising of cattle becoming increasingly common. Uh, so those are your big sort of uh, agricultural factors that you're seeing. The, the, the big distinction that we do see starting in the 1760s is the population does start to sh uh, really shift quite a bit up to the 1760s. This is ostensibly a white population in this area of Virginia. Unfortunately and increasingly commonly what we do see is that with that economic boom also comes an increase in the enslaved population in this area between about 1763 and 1776, the enslaved population here is rising on average by about 11 and a half percent a year, while the white population increases by about 4% over the same time. So the enslaved population does start to rise here quite a bit. And in 1767, there is sort of a murmur about a, a enslaved insurrection or revolt up in Frederick County, though it was probably more sort of rumor and overreaction than anything else. Uh, but so as far as what life was like, it's not necessarily an easy life. This is a far less settled area, just again because of the geography than Eastern Virginia. This is also an area, when you talk about the French Indian War, that has been beaten, battered, and bruised on constant raids from Eastern Woodland Indians and sort of constant attacks that really stalled the, process, uh, the progress of this area becoming more settled. But what that also really does is very drastically change the population in this area that the people in this area are far different, especially by the beginning of the 1770s, than the Virginians you would have found on the other side of the mountains back towards, say, Williamsburg and what's now Richmond. These people have been formed by the area that they're living in and by the adversity and struggle they're in, that these people have sort of become very hardened individuals in a lot of senses. They've also changed culturally in that these are not full on Europeans anymore. There are some scholars that would argue that some of the men in this area by the 1770s are almost more Indian than they are European in that they've adopted technologies, techniques and ideas from the people that they're interaction, interacting with. What we see pretty commonly by the 1770s, a lot of the men in this area are wearing, at least when they're hunting or when they're going to militia service, what's referred to as Indian dress. So things like leggings, moccasins, and breech clouts. Uh, and likely a lot of that has to do with, you know, if someone's been beating up on you for several decades and have been very proficient at beating you in woodland fighting, maybe they have some good ideas and maybe you should try that out. Uh, and some of our interpreters have tried that here at the museum and have found, yeah, you get a lot more mobility out of running around in breech clout rather than pants. And uh, as far as sort of moving quickly and stealthily through the woods, moccasins are going to do a whole lot better than sort of more conventional European shoes. Uh, but so that's sort of the start of what you see. Um, the other thing that we do see in this area in general leading up to the Revolutionary War is that you have a bunch of sort of young you could almost call them first generation Americans or at least first generation Valley of Virginians uh, who have been raised in this sort of crucible of conflict and are very much identifying more so as members of this area than they are necessarily members of the British Empire as a whole. Mm. Uh, the uh, really good indicators of that, you can look at things uh, leading up to the revolution like the Fincastle Resolves and the Augusta County Resolves, which are really the first inklings of anyone thinking about breaking away from the crown where a variety of these 
Valley Virginia farmers and planters. And uh, your your fellow uh, William Campbell is among them. He signs the Finn Castle Resolves are more or less saying that if you didn't come out here and go through the struggles that we did, then you don't have a right to govern us, which that's paraphrasing, but that's more or less what these people are feeling. Wow. So, I mean, when you're describing life in the valley between the the uniqueness of the farming and the crops, but then also I like how you did the, the crucible of conflict, kind of really creating this separate identity. Um, it's very easy to see where you'd have some very strong leading military minded figures mm-hmm. in the years to come and influencing that entire culture of that region. Um, now, a quick question about something you said before about the size of the farms about 50 to 200 acres. Do we know, is that just due to economic reasons? That's just what people can't afford? Or is that being kind of mandated by some other kind of colonial results? Yeah, uh, to to my knowledge, that's partly sort of a result of these people just not having a lot of income to start off with. Uh, There are certain farms that are larger. uh, So there are farms that are over a thousand acres. Uh, The Bowman family who owned our 1820s farm at the museum, uh, the Bowman family initially comes to the Valley of Virginia in 1773 or 74, and they end up with about 500 acres, uh, all things considered. So you could, in theory, get more land. It's just that the vast majority of people are likely not able to afford land in that much sort of quantity. Uh, we also see that there are plots, you know, as small as 25 acres or so in size. There are even express uh, accounts of you know, advertisements that anyone that comes out to my area of Augusta County builds a cabin of these dimensions. You can have 25 acres of your choice kind of thing. And there are people that are taking that kind of offer up. Uh, In general, when you're looking at the people coming out here, you see all sort of walks of life from a financial and economic standpoint. But it's fair to say that a good number of the people coming here are coming here because they can't afford necessarily to settle and farm with the same quantity of land somewhere else. When you compare land prices in general, the land here in the Valley of Virginia is going for about a third or a quarter of the cost to comparable land in Pennsylvania. So it is really an economically feasible thing for you to come out here and farm. It just takes a lot more hard work. Uh, And that's what you see too, is in the, the decades leading up to the 1760s, there are farmers that have, you know, sort of smaller plots in Pennsylvania who have realized that their land is appreciated drastically in value who are selling up and moving down the wagon road. Um, But so a large part of it is economics. Uh, There might have been a a little bit of restricting as far as overall uh, sort of farm size, but I don't see a whole lot of that in what I've read. Okay, great. Um, Well, we've kind of answered the other, the next question I had prepared for you. Uh, I was going to ask these men of the valley leading up to the War of Independence, are they fighters or farmers? Uh, Well, they're obviously fighters. Um, Yeah, they're they're, they're, they're definitely, they're definitely fighters. They're sort of both in a way in that um, the, the militia system is tremendously active and tremendously hardworking in this area in that the men in this area seem to have been becoming very capable fighters by the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, The really great example of that really right on the eve of the Revolutionary War is Lord Dunmore's War, which occurs in 1774, where uh, a good number of the men from this area of Virginia go off fighting the Shawnee and the Mingo and do a halfway decent job of it. they are very capable backwoodsmen by this point. They understand terrain and topography a lot more uh, to a certain extent. They are understanding quote unquote Indian tactics or how you go about fighting in the woods and doing it proficiently, um, which is a very marked difference from you know 20 years prior, 15 years prior with Braddock's defeat and things of that nature. These people are acknowledging the fact that, you know, The Eastern Woodland Indians in this area knew a thing or two about fighting in this area. Uh, So that is tremendously important. Uh, The other thing as far as... Thanks for that, Travis. I think he was shooting at a deer, but I can't confirm that. Anyway, um, the other thing to consider (laughs) is that um, when you're you're talking about this area again, you are talking about an area where uh, there is a tremendous feeling of disenfranchisement leading up to the Revolutionary War in that 
because this area was treated as a buffer for so long, really without the support of the British Army in any form or fashion, these people feel very disenfranchised towards the crown. And it's very much a case of, you know, what have you done for me lately? Um, so that is all sort of important factors. One of the best sources when you're talking about this area of Virginia leading up to the Revolutionary War is a uh, sort of an itinerant preacher and traveler named Philip Vickers Fithian, who writes journals about his experience in, here in 1774 and 75. I actually have the 1775 one here um, and he just really talks about these this really really great and interesting culture here one of uh, the best e examples of that and he writes this in June 1775 so right at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War he writes that Mars the great god of battle is honored in every part of this spacious colony but here every presence is warlike and every sound is martial drums beating, fifes and bagpipes playing, and only sonorous and heroic tunes. Uh, and that each man represents themselves as the hardy, resolute, and invincible natives of the woods of America. So they're identifying with this area and identifying really because of the culture that is formed out here. Hmm. That's fascinating. And that's a great example, like you're talking about, about just the, the spirit of Mars, the martial conduct of these men as you sit there unfazed while rifle shots ring out behind you. That's a very nice example of that. Yeah, um, uh, it, 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 it certainly, uh, uh, Fidian definitely has a way with words in that uh, he is playing up the martial aspect quite a bit. But these people are definitely used to that kind of thing in a large part more than arguably the rest of Virginia. Um, and you see that even with the dress is that the, the hunting shirt, which is a common sort of frontier garb in the 18th century, um, very quickly gets adopted by the rest of Virginia, probably because they're trying to emulate the guys out here who are really tough, hardened individuals. Right. That's beyond just the relation. Uses, Go ahead. Beyond just the uses of the hunting shirt, it's a pretty great and versatile garment. Well, right, because like you said, with the adoption by Virginia, but then later we'll see adopted by the entire Continental Army under Washington's command. Uh, that nice Virginia frontier influence really making some waves. But speaking of kind of military influence, um, when we're talking about the King's Mountain campaign, probably the biggest name to us coming from Virginia would be William Campbell. Uh, but you've got to have some other major military leaders in such a fighting spirit location like the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, so who are some guys that either come from or will end up serving in the valley? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. There's probably too many to mention. Uh, the big name that always comes out first is usually Daniel Morgan. Uh, Daniel Morgan being really a product of the Virginia frontier. He's the one that always comes to mind. Daniel Boone is another one that comes to mind, though he's not necessarily as active militarily in the Revolutionary War. Uh, you also have people like uh, Charles Porterfield, who uh, Mike Sasir wrote a really great book about him, who he's uh, a guy who goes all the way up into Canada with the Virginia line uh, and then actually dies at Camden uh, later on. Uh, but uh, you have him, you have Joseph Crockett, who is uh, the commander of the unit that we represent here at the Frontier Culture Museum, who served in the 7th Virginia Regiment and is sort of all over throughout the Revolutionary War before commanding the Western Battalion. Uh, you have uh, a lot of really great names. Peter Muhlenberg, uh, the fighting parson of Virginia, is also from this area of Virginia. Uh, so you have a lot of very capable commanders. And beyond that, you have a lot of very capable men uh, that are sort of the backbone of the Virginia line in the Revolutionary War. So mentioning the Western Battalion and Joseph Crockett, do we know, is that a relation to the later David Crockett? Uh, very distantly. We've tried to do the genealogy on it, and the Crockett family is a literal nightmare uh, <laughs> because they have, everybody, everybody in the Crockett family has, you know, eight to ten kids, and they repeat names very, very commonly. Uh, but it seems that the relation between him and Davy Crockett is he would have been probably a second or third cousin twice removed or okay. once removed. Uh, so it's distant. Uh, so the entire Crockett family comes into the Valley of Virginia much in the same way that I've talked about uh, coming down the, the wagon road into the valley from the top. Some of those Crockett's stay here. Some of them don't not, do not. 
uh, Davy Crockett's ancestors more directly go into the Carolinas and don't really have a whole lot of success there. And eventually after the Revolutionary War, make it out to Tennessee. Um, but so th that Crockett family or that section of the family moved on a little bit. Joseph Crockett's parents actually settled on the other side of the mountain in Albemarle County. Uh, and his father was a school teacher there. And then uh, when Croc Joseph Crockett becomes an adult, which would have been early 1770s, he moves into the Valley of Virginia and establishes a store here in Stanton. So he's not exactly a product of the Valley, but he's lived in the Valley long enough that he's sort of adopted the culture. Okay. So we talked a lot about the uh, the military culture and the military impact of the French and Indian War and that frontier fighting in the Shenandoah Valley, um, but let's skip up into the revolution. Um, later in 1781, after you have the Patriot victory at Kings Mountain, it's said that Lord Cornwallis offers a reward, a bounty on William Campbell because of the part that he played in the Kings Mountain campaign. Um, now, we know that Campbell was never captured by the British. He actually dies of a fever in the summer of 81. Um, but we do know that the British do reach up into Virginia, the 1781 Virginia campaign. Uh, so when they're pushing from the coast, pushing westward, do they reach the Shenandoah Valley? And if they do or don't, is this kind of the only time that the valley is threatened? Are there other British regulars who do reach the valley? Yeah, so uh, the easiest answer is they get really close, but they never actually get here. Um, as far as active soldiers with firearms, yeah. there are soldiers, uh, British soldiers and Hessian soldiers in the Valley of Virginia as early as the spring of 1777. Uh, but those are all prisoners of war. Uh, uh -huh. The important thing to consider is that this area is so geographically isolated that the mentality that Virginia takes is that you can plop a bunch of POWs out here and they're not going anywhere because they don't have anywhere to go. Uh, so a large part of the troops captured at uh, Trenton are being kept here in Stanton. Uh, beyond that, the Convention Army, which is captured at Saratoga, some of them are being kept here and a good number of them are being kept on the other side of the mountains at the Albemarle Barracks towards modern day Charlottesville. Um, but so there are, are troops in the valley. They just don't have firearms or really anything that they can do, uh, which they actually do lead to some pretty great accounts. There is a Hessian officer who says uh, that we don't have good neighbors here uh, in Stanton. There's hardly a gentleman living in 40 miles. Uh, <laughs> so that's probably a good indicator of the people out here as well. Uh, but as far as active military forces trying to get here, the closest they get is the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountain, and that's Bannister Tarleton in 1781. Uh, so Arnold and his force coming up from the coast uh, chase the Virginia Assembly and Jefferson, who's the governor out of Richmond, which was the capital in 1781. Uh, Jefferson and the Assembly flee to Charlottesville. So for a brief period of time, Charlottesville is the capital of Virginia, so to speak. Uh, Tarleton uh, and a M bunch of his British Legion guys, along with some mounted infantry, try to chase the Virginia Assembly down, don't really manage to capture them or Jefferson, the governor, and they flee across the, the mountains here to Stanton. And for a brief period of time, Stanton is sort of the capital of Virginia. Uh, it seems that Tarleton got up to the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains and said, uh-uh, uh, and turned back uh, and was not going to attempt to cross. It's probably good that he didn't. Uh, he probably would have been pretty heavily ambushed trying to go over the mountain pass. Uh, but so they don't really actually get here. They just get real close. Uh, and then, of course, after Yorktown, a number of the troops that surrender there are moved into the Valley of Virginia up towards the Winchester area uh, where there's prisoners of war. But so they, the, the British Army never quite reaches here, but they get awful, awful close. That's great that you pointed that out about the prisoners of war. Uh, when you think about British prisoners being captured and you read about how the Americans placed them in these pla these locations where they were considered secure and you hear, well, they were in Virginia and you think, OK, well, the British are campaigning in Virginia. How is this a safe location? You forget about the valley and how, it, like you said, was so geographically isolated that even though it's there just across the ridge, that's a pretty significant ridge. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is really a secure place to keep these guys, a uh, an earthen fortress, pretty much. Um, 
that, that that's really great. Uh, yeah, it, so it's sort of useful as well in that uh, the the difficulty here, and one of the big points that I haven't quite hit is how much of a breadbasket uh, the Valley of Virginia is for the war effort. Uh, in that there are wagon trains of supplies going from the valley as far north as New York City, uh, bringing mostly food to the troops. The difficulty is that if all the guys out here go off to fight with the Virginia line, there's not a whole lot of people to handle the farms back home. So it seems that at least when it comes to the prisoners of war that are being kept here in Augusta County, the, the effort consciously was to bring them out here to work them on the farms. Um, that these guys, these British and Hessian soldiers were being put to work in the field to further provide uh, food and supplies to the to Virginia's war effort. Well, so I had another question prepared for you, but we're going to skip that one and go to a, uh, I had a, a, a hypothetical. I usually like to end our interviews with the, the kind of the what if question, mm -hmm. um, but what you just touched on really puzzle pieces nicely. Because um, like you're talking about with it being such a major supply source for the American war effort, you have Nathaniel Green in the south having Virginian men and supplies, food coming down, it's going north to Washington. And the British know this. This is one of the main reasons for Cornwallis's Virginia campaign is to push in and destroy this breadbasket for the American war effort. This, in fact, is one of the reasons why when William Campbell first receives uh, the letter from Isaac Shelby talking about uh, the McDowell's needing help, talking about Ferguson pushing into the Carolinas, Campbell says no. He says there's too much going on. There's too many dangers in southwestern Virginia for him to draw his men away and go off on some wild goose chase. And it's only later on with additional letters and with the influence of Arthur Campbell that William finally agrees and brings a couple hundred men down to help chase Patrick Ferguson. So kind of the what if that I have for you is if Campbell had not been persuaded, um, if you do not see... Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, if Campbell does go, if he does take these hundreds of men with him away from defending southwestern Virginia, and if he gets to the Kings Mountain, if he attacks Patrick Ferguson, but Ferguson wins, if southwestern Virginia is suddenly without 400 of some of their best picked militiamen, these frontier riflemen, how do you think that's going to change the, the course of the war? Do you think this would have allowed that area to possibly um, lose those prisoners? Was there enough of a loyalist population to then rise up? Would the British have pushed harder? Would Tarleton have been able to cross that pass in the Blue Ridge if Campbell and these 400 men from the south were no longer available to help? Yeah, it's an interesting sort of thought. Uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind with that in general is that um, there certainly are troops. So Crockett's Western Battalion are at the Albemarle Barracks at that time. Uh, and there are troops uh, like George Slaughter's Corps of Indian Fighters who are up at the uh, Redstone Fort at that point. So a little bit further up north towards Pennsylvania. You have Virginia troops that are here, but Crockett's Western Battalion was more or less formed that summer. So they would have been very green. Uh, in general, you probably would have had a pretty big problem with manpower defending Virginia overall. Uh, when we were sort of talking about this, uh, we talked about this earlier this morning before the meeting, uh, what we sort of sort of surmised is that had Ferguson won at Kings Mountain, the potential was there for almost a three-pronged assault on Virginia with Arnold coming up from the coast. Ferguson, which Kings Mountain is very close to the wagon road, could have followed the wagon road right up into the Valley of Virginia, and then uh, presumably Cornwallis could have pushed through the center, and that would have been tremendously problematic. Again, the Valley of Virginia is providing a lot in the way of supplies. Uh, you have lead mines down towards Wyth. Uh, you have uh, all the wheat that's being produced in the northern end of the valley. You have a lot of cattle being produced in the valley as well. Uh, it's very possible if the Continental Army even gets to Yorktown, which is a big if at that point, they would have starved before they presumably could have forced a surrender from Cornwallis. Uh, the Valley of Virginia during the Yorktown campaign sends about 500,000 pounds of cut and dressed beef, 200,000 pounds of flour 
to the troops along with sort of sundry other other supplies and that's what actually allows the continental army to continue the siege at yorktown so if if ferguson raids the valley the previous year that's not happening that's that's fully out of the cards the other thing that you mentioned is yeah what do you do with the convention army uh, when Arnold invades uh, Virginia in the sort of winter of 1780 to 1781, the immediate response is we need to move these troops out of Virginia as quickly as possible. So what Crockett's Western Battalion and the uh, Brigade of Guard, or the, the Albemarle Guards who are uh, guarding the Convention Army do is very quickly march those troops up into Maryland towards what's now sort of Frederick. Um, they successfully do that, but one would imagine that uh, a force of you know several thousand POWs probably doesn't move that fast. And if they had proficient fighters like Patrick Ferguson clipping at their heels, it's very possible that they don't make it all the way to sort of safety in Maryland in time. And that the, then the real difficulty that you have is that Patrick Ferguson could potentially awake sort of a sleeping giant of all of these prisoners of war. Uh, the, the question is then how do you arm and equip them and that might be a little bit more difficult to accomplish but there are arsenals at Stanton at Point of Fork uh, in Richmond before Arnold burns them so there are possibilities on how you equip those say three to four thousand men which could have really been the death knell for Virginia in the war overall um, so it is particularly good that uh, you know Kings Mountain went the way it did uh, there might have been some semblance of a resistance if, if Ferguson had won, but I very much doubt that it would have been an effective one. Wow. So we can kind of subtitle this interview, How Kings Mountain Saved the Shenandoah Valley. Yeah, to, um, to, a, to a great extent. <laughs> so this is great. Sam, I want to thank you so much for answering all the questions that we've had for you. Um, kind of one last one, it was going to be a little bit earlier, but about follow-up, about uh, further research. If people, they've been inspired by this, they want to learn more, they want to really tuck into the Shenandoah Valley, the Virginia frontier, the revolution. Um, of course, you've got the great site there and stand at the Frontier Culture Museum. Um, but are there any other historic sites and are there any good books, write-ups that you would recommend to kind of shed more light on it? Yeah, so I have a, a little bit of a stack of books here. The first thing that I'll always point to as far as a great primary source for this area, really right at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, is again, Philip Vickers Fithian, which this is a little bit difficult to come across in that uh, this hasn't been in print in a good number of years. He has two journals. The first one is really up to 1774, and then this one is his 1775-76 journal, which he's talking really about the outbreak of the Revolutionary War in the Valley. Um, Fithian actually will die uh, a year later in 1776. He joins some New Jersey unit and dies in New York City of disease in a, in a military camp. Uh, but his journal is tremendously valuable. One of my first uh, and sort of favorite books as far as getting into the history of this area in the Revolutionary War is actually The Valley of Virginia in the American Revolution, uh, which is by Freeman Hart. Uh, again, a little bit difficult to get your hands on. You might be able to find it on Amazon. This gives a great sort of overview of the Revolutionary War and the Valley in particular on, uh, it, it's really from 1763 to 1789. It goes through really the context of the area leading up to the war, uh, the war in this area, the loyalists that are here, which not very many, um, and then the post-war economic troubles that this area has. Uh, another great book about a Valley Virginian, uh, Charles Porterfield. Uh, the book is an offer of an officer of very extraordinary merit. Uh, this is by Mike Sasir, who runs the Seventh Virginia uh, Reenacting Group. Another really great book. This is a very interesting dude that has about as rough a war as you could expect to have, um, but uh, is another one of these great Virginia men. Uh, so those are the three sources that I recommend off the bat. Um, if you're learning about sort of frontier history in general, there are a few different historic sites. We're certainly one of them. Uh, Fort Dobbs, a little bit earlier sort of frontier, but Fort Dobbs does cover the French and Indian War better than most places. Uh, those are the, the, the sites that come to mind off the bat. Great. So it sounds like you got a nice reading list there. 
Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing all this information, showing how the culture of the Shenandoah Valley, how it was distinct, but it created this distinct kind of individual that going into the Revolutionary War is going to be a big power player for military might, for supplies, for a place to put POWs, and it's going to be a big cog in the American war machine. So thanks again for talking with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thank you everybody for watching. This has been another episode of Trail Talk where we're discussing the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, trying to better understand the world of the Overmountain men in the American frontier. So thanks for watching.